Hello everyone. I'm going to uh, follow up on the previous presentation which mentioned the dominance of digitalization in universities and also solutionism um, by talking about work that um, myself and my colleague at uh, Copenhagen, Daniel Haygood, have been doing on um, digitalization in the University of Copenhagen and also drawing on work that I've been doing at the Far Eastern Federal University in Russia. Um, one of the common um, sort of refrains around digitalization is that somehow the university in its present state is not terribly well fit for purpose in a world that's changing very fast. Universities are obviously very slow moving organizations. And so we have to somehow change the institution to keep up, to, to sort of keep pace with uh, particularly the digital environment and the teaching of digital skill for uh, students. So as students are able to operate in, in the world as it's unfolding. And of course, this is a dynamic between present and future. And there is a lot of uncertainty around both our understanding of the present and certainly our understanding of the future. And one of the challenges and one of the key points that I really want to bring out in this presentation is that perhaps we all accept that our imaginaries about the future are constructs. So, you know, we and we each of us construct the future in different ways, but perhaps we're less appreciative, less appreciative of the fact that our construction of the present is also a thing. We construct the present and we have different narratives to describe where we are and that this dynamic between our construction of the present and the future is actually implicit, not only in the way that we think about what we should do next, but even in where we think we are. So we have almost this fractal structure where we think of the present, but the present is a dynamic between present and future. We think about the future, which is also a dynamic between present and future, and on it goes. So we have this sort of fractal structure and uncertainty runs through the whole thing. So you can never really conceive of um, um, a present state moving towards a future state because all of this exists in discourse and of course it depends on who's doing the constructing so you can have someone of my generation who remembers microcomputers and was really excited at a very sort of critical time in our lives um, really excited by um, the possibilities of microcomputers we could do something our parents couldn't do that was that was really exciting but that's that's my generation the generation of um, students that we're dealing with are very, very different, as um, Sarah Ogilvie has um, beautifully um, illustrated in her new book, Gen Z Explained. And I think um, I think this is, you know, there's some big issues here about who's constructing what and where the narrative is coming from. One of the areas where the narrative is coming from is in the dynamics, the fundamental sort of institutional dynamics, particularly between government and industry and universities. And this is a this is a dynamic which um, is understood in the context of the discourse around uh, what's called the triple helix. And um, and it really sort of uh, pinpoints that at the nexus of the overlap between government, industry and universities is some sort of innovation process, technology, that kind of stuff. It runs through the whole thing. So you have governments which are regulating, you have industry which is patenting and universities which perhaps might be inventing. You know, it's, it's that kind of uh, dynamic. So we might say, OK, well, that's where digitalization is. And obviously, um, if that's the way you look at the world, then universities becoming divorced from this uh, dynamic between government, industry and universities is, is a concern. So, you know, universities are obviously going to want to sort of not be divorced from it and be part of it. But the question is how to do it. Now, digitalization itself is a very hard to pin down. And it's again, it comes back to this idea of constructs, but it also comes down to the challenge of understanding what technology has done to education. So here's a, a, a visual way of looking at this as a sort of systemic dynamic where technology 
if you look at technology in the environment, it's continually generating new options for us to do stuff. And many of those things that we could do in other ways before. So these are new additional options. And individuals, basically because the, the number of options for us to act is, is proliferating, individuals have a selection problem. And there is uncertainty surrounding that selection problem. How do you choose which technologies to, to use? And um, one way of thinking about this um, is, is to see it as a kind of feedback loop where on the one hand at the top level technology is also giving us new representations of data. It's amplifying the environment or amplifying aspects of the environment. So we get visual forms of visualization. We're able to see black holes thanks to computer technology. We're able to visualize the social web through data analytics stuff. So that's that's a sort of amplification process. And at the same time, we have a selecting an attenuation of um, reality via uh, things like online forms, which only capture certain information and ignore all the rest, or sensors which are designed to look for particular signals. But again, they're not it's not you don't see everything you just see what the sensor or the form picks up so that's an attenuation of course the danger is that we then believe that reality is the totality of what we're able to pick up through our sensors and our forms when actually reality is far greater um, than what, what is actually represented by our technology but this is this is the sort of dynamic situation that education finds itself in and this is what learners are trying to deal with now interesting when you go to an institutional dimension in, in this kind of equation. So here's, here's the same thing. So here's the learner with their uncertainty looking at the world, but then they find themselves in the institution and the institution is a sort of higher level system which is trying to manage the uncertainty of people who are trying to manage their existence in the environment. And so that higher level system, well, we know what it does. It says, use these tools, do this curriculum, um, obey these rules to keep everything in order for the convenience of the institution. And in the context of digitalization, of course, what the institution does is then think, okay, how do we deal with this increasing complexity in the environment? We've got to have a new digitalized curriculum. That's what we've got to have. And we will impose that on the system and things will be, things will be as they were, the institution will be fine and uh, everyone can survive in this increasingly complex environment and nothing much changes. And I think if there is any uh, reality to the notion of digitalization, it is a label for what is effectively a dilemma that learners and teachers and people in the system are faced with. Because on the one hand, they're moving towards, you know, my, my orange arrow here, they, they have to accommodate the environment somehow. Or do they accommodate the institution because the institution is attenuating the technology that they can use, whereas the environment is amplifying it? That is the thing that's sitting behind this um, concept of digitalization. That's the real challenge that we're facing. Now, this is not to say that there aren't important things happening in institutions, traditional things that have always happened. If you look at a subject like chemistry, of course, people are going to need to learn about the periodic table, atoms and molecules, equations, um, how to, you know, the, 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 what, what happens in reactions and so on. And I kind of tried to situate this at the bottom of this sort of searchlight cone here. And the reason why I've drawn it like that is because you start at the bottom and you think, okay, so there's the discipline specific stuff and there are other subjects here and they're separate. So chemistry is obviously a very different subject from anthropology and it's different from law and different from health, for example. So at the bottom, we've got the discipline specific layer, but at the top, we've got this kind of meta discipline layer. And this is where the technology is because as you look at the application of technology to chemistry, you see that that um, technology then starts to overlap with other disciplinary areas. So we start have this sort of transdisciplinary uh, connection happening up here, which doesn't happen down here. So the question is, the, the institution is um, 
they're deeply sort of stratified in um, the different functions that it performs. On the one hand, it's doing this very focused thing in individual disciplines, and on the other, it's sort of opening out to this transdisciplinary uh, world. And the question is, how do we organize this and how do we create opportunities for people to engage with technology um, and move between the bottom and the top and, uh, and back again? So I think there are three strategies, really. I think the first one is um, that you create new transdisciplinary offerings and integrate technology and metadisciplinary practice. So that's the kind of thing that the London Interdisciplinary School is, is trying to do. And uh, it's a very um, exciting development. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's something that's been very close to my heart for a long time that we should be doing this kind of thing. I think the second option is, is down at the bottom, um, and this is really the thinking behind um, the project that I've been working on, the original thinking, which was you've got to change the curriculum. So you've got to change the curriculum and work with teachers to get embrace digital skill, get more computational thinking, that kind of stuff. Um, and, but crucially, you've got to train teachers to support this. Um, and that's a challenge because obviously everyone's different. Everyone has a different understanding. So is everyone going to teach computational thinking? Probably not. The most interesting, I think, is also that you could create a, a middle ground here, which is a co-design process where new tools with students and staff can support personal inquiry into disciplinary and metadisciplinary futures, skills and resources. And, um, and so you can sort of think about this third option as moving from the discipline specific layer to the metadiscipline layer. Or actually, it's, it's kind of like an elevator, really. It moves up and down here. So I'm going to basically just illustrate um, the, um, these three options. I'm going to start with what I've done in Russia, first of all, because this really was, I was very lucky to have the opportunity to create a new transdisciplinary course. We called it Global Scientific Dialogue. And the idea was to use current technology and emerging science to create a curriculum where, where there were no answers. There were only questions. But what you did have were lots of tools and uh, activities, and you could engage people together, teachers and learners together, in exploring very difficult questions, wicked problems, global warming, homelessness, and so on, um, by using these tools and engaging in activities and talking to each other. And, and this led to repositioned educational relationships, very profound um, experiences. And we started doing this face to face. That's what the photo at the top is. And over the last two years, of course, we've had to do it online. Quite remarkably, I think it's worked better online than it did face to face. And that's because we've been able to put more emphasis on tool use and skill development than um, than we were able to do in the classroom. It's much harder to organize people with computers and so on. Whereas if you're staring at your own computer, you can download what you want, you can install what you want, you can go onto whatever website and engage in activities. So that's been very successful. Um, educationally, I think there's a, a principle here which was first uttered by Humberto Maturana, who said that what we learn, we learn about each other. And I think that was a, that was a guiding force in this whole um, course development. It was, it was very much an intersubjective engagement. And really, you know, just to come back to my sort of meta system diagram, this is a way of shifting the emphasis on um, educational organisations onto the middle part of the diagram. So you resolve the dilemma of students trying to fit the environment or fit the institution, you resolve that dilemma through activity, um, engaging with tools and through conversation. It's conversation which is the best way of managing that uncertainty. And certainly the experiences in Russia have, have shown that. Let's move down to the um, option three, which is the, the, the sort of um, the, the, the middle option that I had in my diagram. And the idea that you, you create a pathway from the bottom to the top. So this is something that we have been developing in Copenhagen, where um, we basically focused on trying to um, expose students and teachers to new tools, new ideas, new ways of thinking, both about education and about data analysis and so on, and AI, 
um, trying to instill or find ways of instilling new skills in students, but also thinking about um, generalizing the conversations that we have with teachers and students so that we can create something that's more generic, that's applicable across different, different disciplines. And um, one of the things that we've noticed, so this is a co-design process, but one of the things that we've noticed is that there's a pattern to the conversation that we have, whether it's with teachers or with students or with fac um, senior managers. And it's, it's always the same pattern. The first step is understanding and discovering how people construct their discipline, their identity, their values, and so on. The second step is discussing and demonstrating new options and new uncertainties which are presented by technology. So you, you get the AI out and you show this is what it's doing and this is what it will be able to do. And of course that gets people to think it's very disruptive. Um, so how, how technology disrupts distinctions between the ways that we construct the world. And then you can extend it and you can start to sort of probe and ask um, how what's this going to mean? Um, uh, you know, how, how are our values being changed? How, how are our priorities going to be changed? What kind of things do we need to be preparing our students for? And then finally, there's the business of developing new concrete plans to learn and integrate technical skills. So this is a pattern, and I think our focus really has been on trying to codify this and maybe create some tools which support this kind of pattern. So one of the things that we've been doing is uh, what I call a meta-discipline toolkit, which is an exploitation of the OpenAI library, which is um, a remarkable codification of the internet, which is able to generate text on the fly um, based on uh, patterns that it's learned in the common practice of people talking on the internet in various ways and basically you can give it a, a sentence and it will complete the sentence so you can say what is the future of chemistry well here i've done it and you can see it gives me these four options these are all original bits of text that it's generated and i can demonstrate this um, so this is so you can then ask students okay so look you know do some kind of query on this which option are you interested in what are you interested in in pursuing further and then dig further into these queries and option two, uh, which is the option at the bottom, which is about changing the curriculum. And the truth is it's complicated because um, when you start to look at the institutional structures of subjects and curricula, you find it's immensely complicated in the way that um, there are various bureaucratic levels. So study boards, for example, um, are on the one hand uh, trying to maintain uh, um, standards and consistency and on the other hand you've got people who are really enthusiastic and want to support change and that's also reflected in some of the sort of uh, mechanisms the social mechanisms outside the university as well so just to finish off um, I think there's uh, something to say about the theory of this so um, we really started uh, thinking about the role of uncertainty and how it's important in this whole process by thinking about a person and thinking about their identity, their boundary between themselves and the world, and the inherent uncertainty in maintaining that boundary. Because, well, what do I admit in my personal uh, identity and what is outside of me? Where do I draw that boundary? There must be something that maintains that distinction. And there is uncertainty within the person but there is also uncertainty in the environment and there must be a way of balancing the uncertainty in the environment and the uncertainty within the person. And so there, there must be mechanisms. So we're always anticipating what's going on in our environment and we're trying to balance out what we're anticipating going on in our environment with our own internal uh, management of uncertainty. And the balance between what's happening outside and what's happening inside itself has to be managed. We're steering our way through this, but we don't do it alone because we do it with other people too. And so you can look at this and say, well, okay, well, there are two levels of uncertainty. I call them uncertainty one and uncertainty two, and they're in continual balance. What can we do to change people? Well, the key thing is the way that we anticipate the environment, the way that we construct what's happening around us. 
And so we're making interventions with tools, discourse, structures and practices. And and so that's really, you know, that's how you perhaps can think about using uncertainty to really change the way people are thinking and working in an increasingly complex uh, technological environment and perhaps how we can get people to work together rather better um, in adapting and talking to each other and understanding each other in relation to that environment. Thank you.